In the late 1970s and early 80s, a string of murders terrorized the city of Atlanta, Georgia. Young black children were the targets, and the killer seemed to be hunting them specifically. The police couldn't catch the killer, and the public was starting to panic. Finally, after a long investigation, they caught a suspect, but there still are unanswered questions. Welcome to True Crime Recaps. It's great to have you here. I'm Chris. The Atlanta child murders were a difficult and dark time in the city's history. A chapter that while some say has been closed, others believe it's not over. It was a time when a serial killer roamed the streets, picking off children at any time of the day. Kids just going about their daily lives, running errands for their parents or playing with their friends. It started in the summer of 1979. The first to be found were Edward Smith and Alfred Evans, both 14. They disappeared four days apart, but they were both found on the same day, lying in a field less than 200 yards from each other. Edward was shot in the back. His socks were gone. Alfred was strangled to death, maybe with the belt he was wearing that wasn't his. You might have thought the murders were just terrible tragedies, a one-off horror show that wouldn't, couldn't be repeated anytime soon. But you'd be wrong. The third victim was 14-year-old Milton Harvey. When he disappeared in early September, the community started to whisper about a killer in their midst. He hopped on his yellow 10-speed bike and set off for the bank with a $100 check in his pocket. His mom needed him to pay a credit bill for her, and the Citizens and Southern Bank was only three miles away. The last time he was seen was around 10.30 in the morning. After that, he was gone. Milton liked karate movies and wrestling, but his own moves weren't enough to fight off his attacker. His bike was found a week later. He showed up again in November. A man collecting cans found his remains in an empty lot not all that far away. They noticed he was missing his shoes and socks. A month later on an October Sunday afternoon, nine-year-old Yusef Bell ran down to the Reese Grocery on the corner to pick up something for their neighbor. He never came home. The last time anyone saw him alive, he was getting into a blue car near a playground. Less than three weeks later, his little body was found stuffed in a crawl space in an abandoned elementary school. Somebody had hit him over the head a couple of times before strangling him to death. A few months went by, Christmas came and went, so did New Year's and Valentine's Day. Parents started to relax a little bit. Maybe it was over. It wasn't. The killing didn't stop until 1981 was almost halfway over. Kids would go missing only to turn up murdered, usually asphyxiated or strangled. Some were stabbed or hit over the head with something. One was as young as six. Most were 9, 10, 12, 14, and 15. A few were much older, in their mid to late 20s. 28 bodies in total, almost all boys, two girls, all of them black. By April 1980, there was no mistaking it. Someone was taking their kids. Reports of a strange black man handing out flyers and chatting up the local kids circulated. Others remembered a white man cruising around, going way too slow not to be looking for something or someone. But no one knew for sure who the boogeyman could be. Not enough to warn their kids. But they weren't going to just sit there and wait for their own children to disappear. Camille Bell, Yusuf's mother, put together the Committee to Stop Children's Murders. They didn't know if they could catch the killer, but they were damn sure going to try. The FBI didn't seem to think there was a case there, but the community did. They saw a pattern emerging. Roughly the same ages, same background, same neighborhoods. Some of the kids even knew each other. It couldn't be a coincidence. And then it stopped. They hoped. A few months went by with every kid accounted for. Maybe the murder frenzy had been enough to satiate the child killer. But it wasn't. By June, he was hungry again. Coincidentally, so was 12-year-old Chris Richardson. He went down to the Crystal to get a burger on his way to the local pool for a swim. When they found him six months later, he was wearing some other kid's swim trunks. Less than two weeks later, six-year-old Latanya Wilson was taken right out of her bedroom early in the morning. She missed her seventh birthday by one day. It was October before they found her body. The day after Latanya was taken, 10-year-old Aaron Weish got into a strange blue car outside a grocery store with a black man, according to witnesses. Some say they saw him at the mall later that night around 6, but the last place he was seen was under a bridge with a broken neck and signs of asphyxiation the next day. The latest killing spree showed no signs of stopping. 
In early July, nine-year-old Anthony Carter was playing hide-and-seek with his cousin when he was taken. The next day, he was found in an abandoned warehouse with stab wounds. And on and on and on it went like that. There were so many kids dead, the Atlanta PD formed a task force to stop it. But the body count kept adding up. When nine-year-old Aaron Jackson was taken from a shopping center in early November 1980, a little less than a month after yet another little boy's body was found, the attorney general ordered the FBI to step in and help stop the killings once and for all. Eight days after they carried Aaron to the morgue, 15-year-old Patrick Rogers went missing. One neighbor remembered him talking about a man he met who wanted to record his music. Almost a month after he disappeared, his body was found near a bridge. Wayne Bertram Williams was 23 years old, a native of Atlanta and the son of two teachers. While his parents were thought to be good people, Wayne had the reputation of being a liar. He made himself the center of fantastical stories that everyone found hard to believe. He fancied himself a freelance photojournalist and a self-proclaimed talent scout. He even set up an amateur radio station in his parents' home. He was well known around town at the different radio stations. People often saw him passing out flyers to kids and teenagers looking for wannabe superstars. And a lot of times, he had cash in his pocket for kids who were interested in making a little pocket money, helping him hand out flyers. 14-year-old Luby Jeter was a kid like that hardworking, trying to save up his money. He did odd jobs at a grocery store and washed cars. He even started his own little business selling air fresheners. That's what he was doing when he vanished outside a mall at 2.30 in the afternoon on January 3rd, 1981. A month later, they found his strangled body all but naked laying in a wooded area. His jeans and belt turned up in a creek less than a mile away, shoved in a brown bag. His shirt and shoes were about 300 yards beyond that. In the meantime, a friend of his, 15-year-old Terry Pugh, had also gone missing. And he was already found, but the how of it all was very different. Thirteen days before Terry was last seen shooting hoops in a park, an anonymous caller told police to check out an isolated spot off a country road. There was a boy's body there, he said. But they didn't see anything, so the guy called again and told them to check one more time. He claimed he added a body since they first talked. It was Terry. In early February, 12-year-old Patrick Baltazar was last seen at Fisherman's Cove, where he worked part-time at Fisherman's Cove Restaurant. His dad worked there, too, which is why Patrick happened to be there that day, doing what all kids do, hitting up a dad for money. He wanted tickets to a boxing match that night, or maybe he'd blow it at an arcade. One person says they saw him there late that night, but he ended up near an isolated parking lot, strangled to death. But his body turned up some valuable clues. Fibers that matched those found on at least five other victims. Whoever this monster was, he had an insatiable appetite for death. Days after Patrick played his last arcade game, 15-year-old Curtis Walker was last seen looking for odd jobs to make some extra money late on a Thursday afternoon in February. Dogs tracked his smell to the back of an elementary school. Someone said they thought he got into a light-colored car. Four days before Patrick's mostly naked, strangled body was found near a bridge, another 15-year-old went missing, Joseph Bell. He was playing basketball when a friend said he saw him leave in a car driven by a black man. About a month later, his body was found the same way Patrick's was. Nothing on except his underwear. On a river's edge, strangled. But... Here's another strange clue. The day after he disappeared, the restaurant where he worked said he called there to say he was almost dead. Was this killer taking these kids and holding on to them for a while before he left their bodies behind? The FBI wasn't ruling anything out. A little over a week after Joseph went missing, 13-year-old Timmy Hill dropped out of sight. A few weeks later, he was found in the river in the same condition as Patrick and Joseph. And then, it seemed the killer started to get bored with little kids. Maybe he wanted a challenge, because the next to go was 21-year-old Eddie Duncan. The last confirmed sighting was around 6 p.m. on March 20th, 1981, just nine days after Timmy Hill disappeared. Eddie was dropping off a neighbor's clothes at a dry cleaner's. He was found in the same area of the river as Timmy just one day after the 13-year-old was found. And then another man went missing, only to turn up murdered. 
20-year-old Larry Rogers. Bizarrely, like so many of the other victims, the killer dressed him in someone else's clothes. This time, it was blue shorts over a white swimsuit and a blue shirt. And the dog hairs were there, too. Larry wasn't what you would call a kid since he was 20, but he was small for his age, only five foot six and 110 pounds. That was a pattern with these older victims. They weren't exactly children, but they had the same body types as young teenagers. The next victim, Michael McIntosh, was 23, but only 115 pounds. The entire city and even the Justice Department was in on the chase now. Strangers joined up with members of the community to patrol the back alleys and abandoned lots, hoping to catch the killer. But none of them managed to grab him. Two days after Michael was found strangled, naked, and left near the river, 21-year-old Jimmy Payne disappeared while looking for work. Five days after that, he was found, like so many others, naked but for his underwear floating in the river. A month later, 17-year-old William Barrett was spotted lying on a curb by the side of an isolated street. He'd been strangled and robbed of his jean jacket, but the same dog hair was left on his clothes. As the FBI kept looking for patterns, they focused on the Chattahoochee River where so many of the bodies ended up. It stood to reason if they stuck close to that area, they might catch their killer in the act. Then, one night in May 1981, they reeled in a fish. A big one, they hoped. Wayne Williams was driving across the Chattahoochee River when he saw the telltale red and blue lights flashing behind him. Pulling the car to the side of the road, he waited for a policeman to approach. It's hard to tell what was going through his mind at the moment, but he probably didn't expect to be put in handcuffs and hauled down to the station. Or maybe that's exactly what he was afraid would happen. You see, as the feds were staking out that area of the Chattahoochee, they heard a loud splash, and lo and behold, a few seconds later, Wayne Williams drives off the bridge. He explained that he was a big music guy on his way to audition a singer out of town. He told them he dropped a bag of trash off the bridge, but his alibi didn't check out. The address and number of the lady he was supposed to be meeting didn't exist and the gloves and nylon rope they found in his car definitely didn't make him look more innocent. And the splash they heard? They believed it was the sound of Wayne's most recent victim going over the side of the bridge, 27-year-old Nathaniel Cater. Two days later, he was found dead and naked in the river, not far away from the place Jimmy Payne's body was found. Cause of death for both? Asphyxiation. Was it just a coincidence that Wayne was behind the wheel of the first car to come across the bridge after the telltale splash? They figured he must have pulled over in the middle, thrown Nathaniel off the bridge, and motored on the other side where they nabbed him. With him in custody, they hooked him up to a lie detector and started firing questions at him. According to the machine, his reputation as a liar was well deserved. He failed the polygraph. And then, hairs and fibers were taken from Nathaniel's body. They matched fibers taken from Wayne's home, his car, and you guessed it, his dog, a German shepherd named Sheba. When police questioned the people Wayne worked with, they got even more incriminating evidence against him. People remembered scratches on his face and arms right around the times of the murders. It was all circumstantial at that point, but it sure didn't look good for Wayne. As far as the cops were concerned, they finally had their guy. Everything was lining up and making sense, at least to them. As far as Wayne was concerned, it was all BS. He professed his innocence to anyone who would listen, even going as far as having a press conference in front of his parents' home the day after he was questioned. He made sure the press got copies of his resume while he was at it. Meanwhile, as he was trying to get the public on his side, the police were busy tying him to the murders of Nathaniel Cater and Jimmy Payne. On June 21st, 1981, Wayne Williams was arrested. The trial began in January 1982 and lasted two months. The case against him relied on fibers from his home, car, clothes, and dog. The prosecution also had witnesses that put Wayne with some of the victims. They said he was a pedophile who liked little boys, and the burned remains of photographs in the Williams family barbecue led police to believe that maybe the amateur photographer was trying to get rid of pictures he took of his victims. But through it all, Wayne insisted he was innocent. He demanded to get on the stand and defend himself, tell the jury his side of things, but in the end, taking the stand didn't have the effect he wanted it to. He was making his case calmly and carefully at first, but when the prosecution started pressing his buttons, he lost his temper, and as far as the jury was concerned, they'd just witnessed a killer flying into a rage. 
After 11 hours of deliberation, they came back with a verdict on February 27, 1982. Guilty. Sentenced to two lifetimes in prison. But hold on. He was charged and found guilty of murdering two men, Jimmy and Nathaniel, 21 and 28 years old. So how did police link him to the murders of all those little kids? They say the same fibers and dog hairs matching Sheba, the German Shepherd, were found on at least 11 victims. Of course, that's also been a hot topic of debate over the years. The hair was a match, but that didn't mean Sheba was the only dog they could have come from. It looked suspicious, but it wasn't conclusive enough to charge and convict him for those children's deaths. But they managed to attribute 22 of the child murders to Wayne based on what they had. They called them pattern killings, but he's never been officially charged for any of them. No one has. However, it's worth pointing out that the killing stopped after he was behind bars. Or maybe the killer just moved on. Some parents of these children don't believe Wayne is the guy. They're still seeking justice for the young lives that were stolen from them. On the other hand, at least one man, Derwin Davis, told the Atlanta Journal he's positive they got the right man, even if he wasn't technically convicted for the child murders. And Derwin should know. He was almost a victim himself. In 1979, he was 14 and found himself in a car with a man he swears was Wayne. He reached down to grab him and Derwin hit him in the face and ran for it. Years later, when he saw Wayne on TV, he knew he was looking at his attacker. And he's not alone. Others told their story too. Same kind of thing. A black guy with glasses offering them a ride to school or home or where have you. Then the creepy questions start. Then a grab for their private parts. Those guys managed to escape. Maybe dozens of others didn't. The is he or isn't he debate over Wayne's guilt or innocence has lasted all these years. Some people believe that justice was served, while others like DeKalb County Police Chief Lewis Graham believe the wrong man is in prison. In 2005, he reopened the murder case linked to his county to try and prove Wayne's innocence when it came to the children. But the investigation was dropped after he resigned. The new chief let it lie. Without new evidence or any new leads, they had no place to go with it. There was nothing more they could do. And there's a third group of people that believe Wayne killed most of the victims, but not the two girls. The only two outliers in a group of at least 28 missing and murdered. But if you're one of the people who still wonder if Wayne was responsible for any of the killings, you should know that he wasn't the only good suspect in this case. In 2005, it came to light that Charles T. Sanders had been investigated in connection with the murders. Charles T. Sanders was a white supremacist that had ties to the KKK and had been recorded praising the murders. He didn't take responsibility for the murders, but he was in favor of them. Police investigated the claims but found no evidence linking him to the murders, and once he and his brothers passed a lie detector test, the case against them was dropped. Unfortunately, you can't just throw someone in prison just for being a complete a-hole. Wayne Williams hasn't just been sitting in prison coping with his fate. He has maintained his innocence and has never stopped trying to get an appeal. And as of 2022, he has a new lawyer and he'll be back up for parole in 2027. His lawyer thinks he's got a good case, but that's what she's paid for, of course. So what about you? Do you think he's the Atlanta child murderer? Or did the real killer go free? Happy to let Wayne take the blame. And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.